Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here, hoping this finds you all safe and well. I'd like to welcome you to yet another installment of City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatushaloni peoples, from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the fall season and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. Tonight, we are delighted to have with us the virtuoso storyteller Iwim Ekpan, celebrating the release of his new novel, New York, My Village, published by W.W. W. Norton. It has been generating a great deal of buzz and conversation. Uh, Joe Hamia of the New York Times just gave it a really nice write-up. And there's a really a lot going on in this book. It is a layered with just observations and, and ideas relating to human relations. Very rich, very bountiful narrative. So we really love books like this here at City Lights. And we're very honored to have Mr. Akpan gracing our virtual halls and sharing his words with us tonight. So a bit of a background for you. Uwim Akpan's fiction and autobiographical pieces have appeared in The New Yorker, The Nigerian Guardian, O Magazine, and many other outlets. His collection of stories, Say You're One of Them, won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in the Africa region and Penn Open Book Prize and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and was the 2009 Oprah Book Club selection. He is from Ikot Akpan Ida in the Niger Delta in Nigeria and makes his home in Gainesville, Florida. Joining Mr. Akpan tonight is Helon Habila. Mr. Habila is a Nigerian novelist, poet, and editor whose writing has won many prizes including the Music Society of Nigeria National Poetry Award, the Kane Prize in 2001, and the Commonwealth Writers Prize in 2003. He's the author of the novels Waiting for an Angel, Measuring Time, and Oil on Water. Mr. Habila is also on the board of the African Writers Trust, as well as coordinator of the Fidelity Bank Writers Workshop in Nigeria. He has played an active role in the literary life of the African continent. He's been a lecturer and journalist in Nigeria before he moved to England, where he was a Shevening scholar at the University of East Anglia. Currently, he teaches creative writing at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. So please join us now in giving a warm welcome to our guests. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights Live. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Hi, Owen. It's good to be here. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. It's been a long time. I know. I yeah. know. <laughs> First of all, congratulations on your your novel. Beautiful. I just finished reading it. It's it's <laughs> really amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I still remember you winning the Kane Prize in two thousand and one. Um, yeah. I was in Kenya. And I, I know what that meant to all of us who had dreams and hopes of writing, you know. And I think yeah. that was the second time the prize was being, you know, uh, offered. Yeah, uh, I was the second winner. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. That, that, was, that, was, that was big. <laughs> and, then, and then your book came out, um, your collection of short stories, say you're one of them, and it went on to have this phenomenal success. As Peter mentioned, it was picked up by Oprah, and it was a bestseller everywhere, and we read it, and it's just amazing. And I'm, I, I noticed a kind of continuity in theme, especially regarding war and, and things like that in this novel. And it's been how many years now? 13 years between that 13 book and years, this one? Yes, you're right. You're right. So why 13 years? Tell me what happened. <laughs> Did you Helen, I, would, <laughs> I, I would love to write every week, to publish a book every week. I would love to be those, one of those writers who write every other a year, but I could not hack it. I, I tried, I tried, the story did not come together. Um, I had a lot of issues with my personal life, but I will leave that you know, um, uh, leave this uh, aside. I, I first wanted to set the story in Las Vegas. Can you imagine? Las and Vegas. That did not work out. I wanted to set a part of it in China. It did not work out. And I went to do um, a fellowship in New York City, the Coleman 
uh, fellowship. And yeah. a story, <laughs> a story came out of, you know, that whole experience. <laughs> That's amazing. And I think it just, I mean, if you hadn't mentioned that, you know, you, you, you struggle to find, you know, the final setting for it, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, have, you know, um, imagine that because it feels like the story was just perfect you know perfectly made for, for new york it's all about new york new york yeah. is like in the fabric of the story yeah. and i would say you know it's in the title you know new york my village <laughs> <laughs> so it's amazing that you know it wasn't um meant to be the the original setting of the story yeah yeah i i first came to new york in 1993 um so I spent two weeks in the Bronx, Fordham University. Uh, before I, went, I, I flew out to Omaha, Nebraska to begin college. Um, so there's been a lot of the immigrant experience within you know, me uh, for so long and I've been, you know, hoping, dreaming of writing an immigrant story. Mm. I did not always know it would, it would be set in New York, in our city. Um, you were telling me a few moments ago that you also went to Germany to work on another project. <laughs> yes. Traveler <laughs> happened, travelers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, books just kind of, um, they come to you, they are given. Some stories are just given to you. Um, you never actively, you know, plan to write them, but they just happen to you. So mm -hmm. definitely um, travelers happen to me. But I understand that this is a book, this theme, this um, story about Biafra and mm -hmm. the war. How do you call it? Is it Biafra or Biafra? I call it Biafra. That's how we call it in Nigeria. Uh, yeah, that's how I call it, Biafra. <laughs> Biafra, okay, because it's yeah. in the Americans call it Biafra. Okay. So for the sake of our fellow Americans, it's Biafra. You have to bear with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you've always wanted to write this story. It's it's um, Biafra has been with us since we were born. It's it's the should I say like the quintessential Nigerian story, and the people yeah. of my generation, you know, have 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 been grappling with. Um, I was telling you that my father fought in the Biafran War on the Nigerian side. Um, I was born the year the war started in 1967. So it's mm -hmm. always been with us. And it's interesting um, to read about other people's experiences and the interviews that, that you conducted um, in this book. So I guess first I'll ask you to give us a little overview of the book. Then you give us a reading, then we, we, we start. Um, the serious discussion. Yes, the book begins with Ekong Udalsara, who is an editor in Uyo, in a Kwaibom state in Nigeria. Um, he wins this prestigious Tony Morrison Fellowship to come to New York City to understudy how to run a publishing house. But before, of course, before he comes, he needs to go to the embassy to get his visa. He's denied this visa twice. And um, I've always wanted to, to talk about what it means for people from developing countries uh, to go to these big embassies. It's a war zone. It's very tense. So, Anyway, he finally gets the visa, arrives in New York City, gets to this publishing house. He's very well received, he's very at home, but he knows immediately that unlike Times Square, um, the very icon of New York City, he lives three blocks from Times Square in Hell's Kitchen, unlike the diversity in Times Square, this publishing house is simply a white space. He is the only black person there, the only person of color. So that shocks him. 
but it remains just that sharp because he was, or he thought he was in the presence in the company of sweet, wonderful, hospitable people. Um, it takes him a while. Actually, it is the, it is at the first editorial meeting that he realizes that his colleagues, some of his colleagues don't really want to listen to him, that they seek to erase him. Uh, this shocks him a lot and leads to him to have all these voices in his head, that all these street people, they have changed on him. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they don't consider him good enough to edit American stories. So, of course, when you're a minority, the tendency is to say, you handle the minority docket, you edit minority stories. These, is, these are your people. So all of this is very shocking to him. And then he is also struggling with his neighbors in Hell's Kitchen. There's a black American, a Latino, a white American, um, an Asian American. And so he's trying to get to know these people. Of course, he tries to breach them like he would breach people, neighbors back in the village he comes from in Nigeria, but they ignore him. So he's erased, he's erased again. He tries yeah. to ignore him. He's right there with them, but they, you know, him. So, you know, that awkwardness starts building tension within him. Yeah. Um, and then he gets bed bugs. And he's bed struggling bugs. with this. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing already. <laughs> you know, he's struggling with all of this. Um, <laughs> so, it, it, the story is about a group of people that's, you know, trying to live together. Mm -hmm. They try to get to know each other. So they come together, it collapses, they pull apart and then they struggle to come together um, again. And in the midst of this, Ekon goes to um, New Jersey yeah. to attend the Catholic church there. And um, this Biafran war, his father, Ekon's father uh, was killed, disappeared, by Biafra during the war, they came, they seized him, they raped him in front of his family, uh, you know, group rape. The rape of men uh, was not that rare in Biafra. Um, so they raped him there, they take him away. Um, Ekong was in the mother's womb when this happened. So he was born after this, and this thing has haunted him for years. Mm -hmm. um, hence, he comes to New York also to finish editing uh, an anthology of this war by minority writers. Yeah. Um, so he goes to New Jersey. Um, there, some kind of Biafran war breaks out again, <laughs> yeah. uh, and he struggles with that. Uh, the priest, the white priest in New Jersey, does not want them to, to come back to that church. It's a very awkward moment. Yeah, so okay. So back, I don't want you to give I don't want you to give away the plot too much. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> you told me about it. <laughs> I'll just tell you to do your reading now. We'll come, we'll, All right. we'll, we'll discuss some more. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. So he comes, spends four months in New York City, experiencing all kinds of things. Uh, food is very important to the novel. Um, African food, we don't eat stone, we eat ordinary food. So it was important that Ekom found, you know, uh, the, the condiments in a grocery store in New York and actually cooks and, you know, my readers will get to see what we Africans eat or what we Nigerians eat you know, um, it. So there's a lot of culture clash and Ekon trying to live with this diversity and the war memories, you know, jumping into his mind 
and his experience, you know, from time to, you know, the time. He remains sane in New York City till the end, and they celebrate, you know, the food from Nigeria in a very big, you know, way, and they become friends. Um, let me leave it at that so I don't give much away, okay? Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um can you give us a reading for about like five seven minutes okay i'm going to read cha from chapter three when he arrives in new york city the following week molly told me her congress man had put in a call to the state department which had asked the embassy to review my visa application. And when the embassy emailed me an invite to a third interview, everyone insisted it would not hurt to try again, especially since I did not have to fill out another form or pay a new fee. They told me to remember the endless interviews of Hussein's wife before she was allowed to join her husband. This third interview turned out to be a mere formality, though I had gone with a letter from a psychologist to prove that I was sane. My regret was that the pamphlet ladies did not show up that day, though the new visa was centered like a newly minted dollar bill on my passport, I had suffered so much already, I could no longer feel the joy of coming to America. This accentuated the emotional farewell between my wife and me before the flight to Lagos, from which I would get on a New York flight. The old Bequara man did not crack the second interview. They had denied him a visa the third time. His son told me this in an email in which he expressed shock that I had gotten my visa and apologized for not responding to my greeting the day I got my visa. He said his father's health was deteriorating. This weighed on my mind until the stern JFK immigration folks took me in and asked their husband and asked their thousand foolish questions as the embassy doubt had predicted. They said they were calling me, calling to verify my proof of accommodation with my landlord in New York. They said they were calling Molly my superintendent at the publishing house to verify whether she was actually my supervisor or whether I was truly editing a war anthology. When they got angry that they could not reach her with the office number, which was what I had put down on my visa application, I panicked and offered her cell phone number. They called her in New Haven, Connecticut where she was visiting her retired Yale professor parents for the weekend. That Saturday afternoon, August 2016, in my navy blue Nigerian senator wear, I did not feel any relief, even when they finally said, welcome to America and stamped my passport. I did not stop trembling till I cleared customs after more questions and a search of my belongings and finally arrived at my address in Hell's Kitchen in a taxi. <laughs> Stacking a huge bag, a boom box, and a carry-on on my head and strapping a blue red bulky computer bag behind me, I hiked and panted up the tight stairwell to my floor, the steepest steps I had ever climbed since each flight went straight to the next floor. It was worse than climbing a steep Mboridim. And I had to shorten my strides to avoid ripping my trousers. My door was one of the three 
forming a semicircle around the stairwell of rusty twisted vertical bars with sharp edges. The ceiling was a low sky, its leak stains ominous clouds. The round light fixture half filled with dirt, a dying moon. A hallway linked up with this open area like the tail of the news. My apartment was unlocked and painted a light blue, the blinds off white. It was much smaller than I had thought. When I gave Carol, my wife, a video tour on WhatsApp, she did not think much of the kitchen because it was much smaller than ours. But she appreciated the fact that Mr. Lucci had left bread, eggs, peanut butter, cook, and Budweiser in the pink orchid whirlpool fridge to welcome me. And on the lovely little dinner table, instructions about the local shops. He weighed the note with three keys, with further instructions to always use all of them. This table was surrounded by three old bit of chairs. In the living room, there was a bookshelf, a chandelier, a green recliner, and a sunny TV. Atop the shelf, there was a black and white portrait of a smiling old man with large friendly eyes, dried lips, and a black earring and thick silver hair. The windows opened onto the street where a 24 hour parking sign twinkled nonstop. All the windows had gaps, hence the few mosquitoes buzzing in the apartment. Carol and I had not worried about mosquitoes, but about, coming, about the coming winter when we had discussed New York. Besides, we had been told since primary school that American mosquitoes did not give malaria. I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful reading. I like the the way you opened the story with the with the embassy section. And most Nigerians reading this book would immediately relate to, to <laughs> that, to that, you know. Those of us who have been to embassies applying for visa and the humiliating process, you know, that he had to you know, prove that his village actually exists, yeah. you know, that his, that his ethnic group exists to the, to the white um, visa officer, mm -hmm. who they call Lagoon, Lagoon Drinker. Drinker. Yeah, because he <laughs> drinks so much water all the time. <laughs> it's got a very ominous name because he like drinks lagoons dry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is this like from real experience? Have you experienced that before? applying for visa like that in Nigeria? Yes. Um, you know, my first two experiences at the embassy trying to get a visa, 1993, 1995, were good. I had no problem whatsoever. I went back to Nigeria. Time came for me to go to Michigan for my MFA. And I showed up. And it was going well until the interview was said, or asked me to write him a short story. Hmm. You know, can you imagine being asked to write a short story to prove that you are actually a writer so a visa could be given to you? Wow. My legs were numb. I thought he was kidding. But then he offered me pen and paper. I had already spent like five hours at the embassy. And you know how it is once you check in, you cannot go anywhere. You can yeah. only drink water. There's no food. The AC was such that I, you know, I already had a cold. So this made it worse. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty much tired by the time I got to the counter. Um, and I was asked to write this story. I was very angry inside me, but of course I needed the damn American visa. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> So 
I had this rage in my mind, but I was smiling, you know. Um, you don't want to offend these folks in any way, shape. Yeah. But just standing there, and he kept going and coming. So, 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 you know, have you finished? Have you finished? Um, I've never been through something, anything like this. Hmm. I felt really humiliated. Um, normally, it takes me months, years to write. I'm not given to flash fiction. Um, I lie down to write. I don't sit. I don't stand unless I'm in a public. I'm in a public space, yeah, like Starbucks, like a coffee shop or classroom. Then I sit to write. So it was really a, a shocking experience for me. After 15 minutes, I was forced to come up with two stupid sentences. You know, <laughs> I, I gave this to him. And he said, so, 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 what happened next? What happened next? So I had to say, Oga, I beg. This is all I can offer. Yeah. It takes me months. So he took this. Um, and then on the basis of this, I was given my visa. So since that day in 2004, I, I knew someday I'll make, I would make the use of this experience. Yeah. So when I write about that embassy with all the dread and humor and pain, um, I'm transferring, I'm building from what I had suffered, but I didn't want to write exactly what had happened to me. Yeah, exactly. That's good. I mean, you, you handled it so well, not just um, Ikong's experience, but also the experience of other applicants. It's like this community of people just trying to do whatever they can to, to get that visa because it's so important. And then the interviews are so arbitrary, like you just mentioned, just write the story, or they'll ask you to prove you know, that you are sane or prove that you're not a prostitute. <laughs> they are not going for prostitution. Yeah. It's just amazing. But it shows you, you know, how important and how unequal you know, the whole process of getting papers and of travel is. And you know, we discussed that earlier about my book, Travelers, where you know yeah. that that's just it. You know, some people are practically given red carpet treatment, where some people are not at all allowed yeah. to even, you know, get the papers to travel. Yes. But your yes. character, your character comes to New York and then things begin to escalate. Yes. Um, I, I want to quickly jump in. Yeah. Uh, since you've mentioned travelers. Um, an excellent, powerful book. Um, the thing is, sometimes Americans or Westerners not knowing what the visa process is like, they have no way of understanding the desperation that makes people risk going across the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. So they end up saying, why don't they go to the embassy? and get a visa. Um, yeah. when, when Americans see this so-called caravan of immigrants coming from the, to the southern border, crossing seven countries, you know, they said, but you know, why can't they go to the embassies to get visas? Yeah. You stand yeah. no yeah. chance. There's no, <laughs> there's no way. Even yeah. to that embassy is like, it's like uh, it's like a prison, it's very frightening. Even yeah. when you have the resources, even when you want to come here to actually you know, do stuff for America, you're invited to conferences. It's, it's a mess. You can be seriously reduced to dust. And yeah, you have to produce all the documents from your birth certificate to your school certificate, <laughs> all, all the documents, your father's you know, taxes, everything. You have to you have to present it. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I think you you really kind of show that in the opening section, and you also kind of introduce the idea of you know um tribalism, um yes. ethnic differences, all within that opening section. Yeah, cleverly introducing the idea of the divisions and the war, which is the major theme in the book, and. 
also the theme of racism. The moment he enters New York and you know his neighbors basically don't want to speak to him or they, they refuse to answer his greeting when he greets them, there's that gradual introduction. Even though sometimes things take kind of unexpected turns where sometimes we see hostility, eventually it, it changes and they become friends. I love that transition. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, Helen, you are a minority in Nigeria also. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. will relate with this experience. Here in America, you'll be asked, are you Yoruba? You say no. Are you Igbo? You say no. Are you Hausa? You say no. That's the end of the conversation. They've changed. <laughs> Nobody knows about the 497 other ethnic groups in Nigeria. We don't even know ourselves. So for example, I had to ask you before this show, uh, oh God, which ethnic group are you from? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so we don't really exist, and um, and now, you know, it's funny to us sometimes because uh, most times it's painful that we from the Niger Delta, that you know, these minority group groups in the Niger Delta, we actually sponsor the country because of the oil, yeah. uh, which is ninety five percent of how Nigeria makes its money. Um, and to know that we do not exist, that none of our languages is in the constitution. The constitution says Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, English, those are the official languages, you know, uh, of our country. And so all my life I've been thinking, how do I make the Anangs, for example, my tribe to exist? Because if we don't really exist, the day we are massacred, what would the world miss? You see, and I'm sure you have all these issues in northern Nigeria, and I'm very happy that you have become this big writer in northern Nigeria. It must mean a lot to the people. You know, you are, you are, you know, your tribe, your ethnic group, you know. Um, for the children there to say, at least we have a hell on Abila. And I'm going to beg you, put there your <laughs> tribe on Wikipedia so we so so your people can celebrate that. <laughs> of course. Yeah, very important. And um I, I want to see if I can locate or kind of um see how you locate your book. Because most of the books we we read about. When they talk about Biafra, the 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 I mean, most of the books about the civil war in Nigeria just talk about the Biafran side. So do you see this, and you've referenced books like um, Chino Achebe's um, "There Was a Country," mm -hmm. and of course, there's a famous book by Chairman Adichie, um, "Half of a Yellow of Sun." Chino mm -hmm. um, Oparanta is here. She also has a book <laughs> about the <laughs> Biafran war. So do you see this then as kind of writing back and trying to, to show the world um, this, this side of the smaller ethnic groups, their story? Yeah, I, I see it as giving a fuller, our version of events. You know, yeah. every war has many angles and victims, and um, the Igbos have been lucky to have these powerful writers. My friend Chinelo Quaranta, uh, this semester I'm teaching her book under the Udala trees in my class here in Gainesville, and my students mm. love it a lot. Um, Chinua Achebe, as you've said, uh, Chimamanda, and a host of very powerful uh, uh, forces in writing. Um, so the world knows the Igbo version of the story. Um, we have not been that lucky to have, I mean, people have been writing their books, you know, out there, 
by minorities, but we've not been that lucky to have, you know, someone right at this level, I dare to say, uh, where the international community will say, oh, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, so I've been dreaming, planning, you know, hoping that I could do this on behalf of the minorities of the Niger Delta. It's not really the place of the Igbos to write our story. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm not blaming them, you know? I'm just saying, you know, we didn't always have someone who could do it for us. Uh, but now um, people will be able to enjoy if that's the word, or to see other versions of the Biafran war. And you have told me your father fought in this war. Yeah. Uh, he came back quite a different man. Um, so you are also a victim of the war. And I can imagine that there are people there in Northern Nigeria who lost their breadwinners, their fathers, uh, their husbands, and so the Biafran experience continues to haunt us. And therefore, you know, yeah. people from Northern Nigeria can also write about this, you know, uh, you know this war. Um, yeah. I want to say also that, you know, my friend Chinelo has helped me a lot to publish this book. And so have so many Igbos who came to see that it would be nice, it would be educative, illuminating to see other versions of you know this this war True. i see that my brother Mfan is online here all the way from <laughs> nigeria staying up way late to listen to his brother <laughs> nice shout out to you okay yeah go ahead so i'm going to ask you about your research i mean i'm sure some of the stories in the book they, they ring as if you know they're just like accounts people told you and in your acknowledgement you did mention how you traveled all over the world um, interviewing people asking about their war experience um can you tell us a little bit about that about your research yes i was very afraid to write about biafra um i was also afraid to You're, write did you say afraid why yeah, I'll tell you. I also I was also very afraid to write about American publishing. Okay. You know what has happened to the minorities of the Niger Delta is that we have been beaten into silence. Um, any one of us who stands up to say something, the system finishes him off. Look at Ken Sarah Wiwan what happened to him. And so our parents don't really tell us about Biafra. They try to bury the, the pain, the shame, okay? Um, so we are like, like, we can't even say what happened you know, to us. So trying to go around to interview people, Sometimes it was like opening old wounds, you know? Um, and I wasn't always sure that I could put a book together. Uh, so I went to Jawland and you've seen it in the acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to go to a strange village and start asking about the most painful thing to have happened to that village? Whom do you talk to? Why should they trust you? See, and I was traveling through Nigeria at a time where, or when kidnappers were everywhere. So I had to disguise, dress down, use bathroom sleepers, rolled up my jeans, use <laughs> Napo, what we call in Nigeria, Napo cap, you know, change my accent, get a guide, and go to some of these places 
okay? And, and I had to figure out, okay, if you go to do this kind of a thing, you should go to the village chief and introduce yourself or go to the parish priest or go to the imam. So I figured this out, but it was still very frightening. And I would get yeah, here and yeah. said, if you can help me, fine. If you cannot help me, please let me go back in peace. Mm -hmm. um, also going into Igbo land to track stories of how our minorities were killed in Igbo land. Um, you know that IPOP is very alive. This, this, for our American audience, this is our, this is uh, the pro Biafran group. Uh, they are waging this war against the Nigerian government. The Nigerian government is terrible, terrible. They are trying to bring in Fulani headsmen to take over, you know, indigenous lands. And the Igbos and many natives are not having it. And so the government, is using the military to force, you know, this seizure of land. Um, so beyond the pain of IPOP and how IPO, what IPOP is doing, they go still thinking of how to defend their land so that they are not surrounded. So yeah. if you come into this kind of situation and start asking about Biafra, um, it could lead to a very volatile situation. So I had to, you know, get friends who promised they, they were going to protect me in Igbo land. So they told me whom to go to. They told me, um, so I went, you know, you know, a few times, but I was always very frightened because, you know, you could, you know, I, at a point I had to lie. I was still a Catholic priest to save mm -hmm. my, my neck. The situation is so volatile that a lot of Igbo intellectuals who know our story, they're not able to say Biafra did this to the minorities because their homes will be burnt down in Igbo land. There's something mm -hmm. with the Fulanese, they're not able to really condemn Buhari because their homes will be burnt down in the North. So, I have to, as I've done in the book, to be very thankful to so many Igbos who said to me, "When you know what, we are going to help you research this war. Mm. Um, the Igbos have a very robust tradition of arguing in the village square. And so they consider themselves to be people who are not afraid of the truth. And so many of them were like, you know, as the Igbos say, where one thing stands, another thing stands behind. You know, it's a salute to diversity. So many of these people realize that the story of the Biafran war is diverse. And this diversity has to be brought out. Otherwise, we fall victim to what Chimamanda calls the dangers of a single story. Uh, well, but say, while I was doing this, and actually going through this, mm -hmm. I was very scared because anything could, 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 could go wrong. So that's what I mean by I was scared. So that's scared in doing research, but I was also scared because for many years, I had all this research, but the stories, the book was not coming together. And you, you can see how complex the book has ended up you know, yeah. being. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's um, it's it's complex. And even though the I think the predominant theme is is the war, there are all these other stories in the book. Um, you did mention food, race, publishing, um, friendship. It's so layered. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for me, I think one of the things that stand out is your characterization. Every character is just so powerfully drawn. Um, most importantly, the Ekong, the main mm -hmm. character. Ekong, of course, his name means war. Yes. So that, that's a very, very symbolic name. Um, 
but he's just such a fascinating character. He's so full of energy. Sometimes I feel like telling him, hey, why don't you just slow down? <laughs> you know, he's, <laughs> he's either going to the office in the morning or he comes back, he's cooking or he's going to write aid to buy anti-bug, you know, powder. <laughs> or he's going to his work. He's just so, so lively. Yeah. And such, such an, I don't know if you want to use the word nice, just interesting and just honest. Um, he just says what he feels. That makes him so endearing as a character. And I think yeah. you really capture, you capture him so well. So now yeah. second part of your, of your research, publishing. Publishing. How, how did you go about that? Publishing, yeah. American publishing and its complexities. Um, you know, the, uh, to, for, uh, because, how do I say it now? I want to say for the benefit of our audience that Helen and myself, we share the same editor, Elaine Mason. Full disclosure. Great, great, great yeah. editor. Uh, we say we share the same publishing house now, uh, Norton. Um, so <laughs> uh, Elaine has helped me a lot mm. to shape you know, this narrative, this book. Uh, characterization because technically speaking you know she said to me you know you when this book is very complex in a good way but each time when you have not talked about a character for like 10 pages and the person comes up just stop and describe the person a bit help mm -hmm. us remember him Okay, yeah. so I was very conscious doing that so that the characters can be closer to the reader. So I'm constantly stopping to show something about his physical or their physical beings, about their emotional makeup, about how they are, excuse me, dressing. And you are so much in Ekong's mind so that when he's angry, you know it, even when his colleagues are not privy to that anger. Mm -hmm. uh, all this was meant to draw the, the characters closer, you know, to the reader. Um, now, ever since my first book came out, or when I was trying to sell my first book, there was a protracted auction and like 12 publishers were excited. When you are in that kind of situation, you start making friends. And so I visited a lot of these powerful publishing houses of New York. And I would walk in to visit a friend and I just realized this is, this is absolute, this is an absolute white space. There's no minority a mile away from this. And it shocks you because you know, you're like, this is so different from Times Square. This is so different from New York City itself. You know? And then the funniest thing was, if, I mean, I've not said this in the book. If you run into a minority, say a minority editor, it was so strange that the person was like trying to run away from you. You know, the person <laughs> did not want to really relate with you as if the person had no permission to entertain another minority or was so mm. shocked that, you know, so we're so shocked to find each other, okay? Mm. This is what I was seeing. Um, so I always knew that I would write about, you know, this experience. Yeah. Because yeah, I no. knew immediately publishing had betrayed us. Mm -hmm. Every person of color, is implicated, is tortured, humiliated, shut out by that betrayal. Forget about the fact that our big brothers and sisters have been using this system. Um, at some point, someone had to say, and people are beginning to say it, publishing, you must open up. 
Google has diversified, Amazon has diversified, CNN has diversified, even Fox News is trying. So why <laughs> was this, they are laughing. <laughs> At least they have black faces there, yeah. <laughs> and Latinos right. and Asians. So why yeah. does this very emotional, important, crucial industry, why yeah. does it choose to remain 90% white? Anyway, so it's one, one question, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but one yeah. question I guess that I will ask you is, what's your experience working with white editors as an African, as a black person? Do you feel that sometimes um, you're not understood? Do you feel that sometimes you are forced to go in a direction that you don't want to go? Have you ever had that problem as, as an African black writer working with white editors who sometimes may not have any knowledge of your cultural background or the kind of stories you're trying to tell? I asked this question because I was talking to another friend of ours um, who said that she was working with her editor who wanted her to kind of introduce a love story between her black character and a white character. You know, the editor just thought that would be nice because maybe Americans are going to like it, you know? And yeah, she yeah. said, no, that's not what I want to do. I don't want, it, <laughs> I don't want it to feel good, you know, to make me put a love story because it will make me feel good to make you feel good. Um, mm. That's not where my story is going. Yeah. Have you ever had that experience? Um, I have had something close to that, but I did not last with that editor. Okay. Um, I have been very lucky over time to have Ellen Mason. Um, and I, she's someone who, it's important to hear that she knows where you want to take this story and to see what best can she do to help you take the story there. So I, I work with her. I don't feel she has an agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, before then, I had Pat Strong, who was also excellent. She's now at Catapult. Uh, I never felt she had an agenda. I felt we were, I, I had these stories I had to tell and she was helping me, you know, um, deal with this. Then of course I had Chrisida Lejeune of the New Yorker. I never felt she had an agenda. Yeah. I'm not going to mention the editor, you know, that <laughs> uh, there's no need to do, to do that. So I know of that experience. Um, and I'm sure the friend who told you this was not reacting to the possibility of being helped to write a better story. She was okay. reacting to the possibility of being forced to please Americans. Correct. You know, yeah. That's a whole different, uh, different thing. Yeah. Um, now we've so been, we've been... very, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I said, we've been lucky, me and you, to, to, to work with editors who have, you know, mm -hmm. who have respected our, our, you know, viewpoints and our stories and just know when to step back and to listen um, and not to force things. So, yes. Elaine definitely has been superb. Yes. And I want to say, because you, talk, you asked me about research. Yes. I want to say... You know, when I finished the first draft of the book, there were no chapters about publishing. There were no, no scenes about real scenes about publishing. Interesting. Um, ah. Because I was so, I just mentioned in a few places, I was just scared because it was like, I knew it was do your damn, you don't, you're damned. Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be like, you write a play about dictatorship and take it to a dictator to stage for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, who is going to publish you going after publishing the way mm -hmm. this book seems you know, to, to do? So that was my fear. Um, and then I got to know that I had to do this anyway. So from 2018, to 2000 and uh, a year, it took me a year to 
to, to come up with the character of Emily, Jack, Angela, Chad, and Paul Maher mm -hmm. to really anchor publishing. So I grafted publishing into the, into the book. And I keep saying it's a miracle because reading it now, you would never know that, you know, four years ago, the book did not have that component. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I finished, I was still very afraid. Of course, the book was rejected in many places. And then I walked and walked and walked and Chinelo, my friend, kept saying, well, you cannot give up. Mm. Uh, what you are trying to say is a problem for all peoples of color who mm. have hopes and dreams of writing. You, you know, you just, so, um, then I thought about Elaine and realized that she had become the vice president of Norton, which means she has real powers. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent the book to her 4 p.m. one day. The following day, when I woke up around 10 a.m., she had accepted the book within 24 hours. Nice. <laughs> I could not believe it. Yeah. And together with... Uh, uh, Norma Madiobi, an Igbo assistant editor at Norton, who took the book immediately and read and said, look, this is, this is publishing in America versus minorities. This is how I felt at embassies in Nigeria. So she was so, so, so excited. Between Norma, Ellen, and myself, we began to deal with the edits. Those two women suggested the maps you see in front of the, you know, of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I felt I had to put in that long acknowledgement to really thank those who had helped me. A lot of white people helped me do the research in publishing. Yeah. And then some of them were saying to me, look, when we see these things every day, we are not happy with it, but publishing is very vengeful. They'll kick your ass. They'll get rid of yeah. you. And the world will yeah. not hear about it because it's very insular. If you succeed in writing a book like this and the masses get to read, then you are securing the presence of diversity in publishing. Because as this country is trying to open up, there's a counter force that is very powerful these days that is pushing back and trying to squash the little power that you know us who are not white have so it's we have to keep building alliances and have allies who are white who are trying to support us if we don't do this this other counter force because you are already seeing what the supremacist white mm -hmm. supremacists are beginning to do in this you know um uh, uh, country. So yeah. I was afraid, but I got it, you know, done. Anyone who has been close to me knows that many days were really, really, really rough. Yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant. I think you captured it so well. Um, we'll also move to Q&A, but before we go, you know, I'll be remiss if I don't ask you about one important thing, the bed bugs. How did you, yes. how did you research the bed bugs? Hello. I still feel, I still wake up in the night, you know, scratching yes. feeling as if I'm in Ekong's bed, you know, with, yes. the, with the bed bugs in yes. New York. Yes, <laughs> let, let me begin with the idea, the concept. I love the movie Jaws. Okay. And that big shark in the water. And as long as that big shark is not killed, you can, you know, you are terrified that it will do something. So it disappears, it appears. So I've always wanted to write a book that had that kind of menace mm -hmm. in it. So once I found bed box in New York City, that was it. <laughs> um, a lot of people tried to discourage me from writing about bed box. 
And I was laughing because I said, remember, I'm the one who wrote about street children in Kenya, a child trafficking in Africa. I allowed you to see the pain and promise of Africa. You must allow me to show this side of America too. So that was, you know, the concept. Um, so I had bed bugs in New York City myself, 2013. It's a very shameful thing. Uh, before I knew it, it bit me twice on my left ribs. Uh, and then I started spraying my room like every two days, you know, to survive. Um, yeah. From those two bites, I was able to escalate it all over a comes fictional body, <laughs> all over the neighbors, all over New York City. Um, I say this because by the time you get to the end of the book, I don't want you to think this bed box beat me any other place except my ribs. <laughs> so I I was, <laughs> and the fear, the fear of when you have bed box, you worry about you exporting it to another place. Yeah. Um, a lot of hotels in New York City have been infested with bed yeah. bugs, by bed bugs. And all these tourists, they come, they think, oh, we are in New York, the, the, the capital of goodness. And, you know, they take bed bugs home. Uh, <laughs> and it worries everyone. Um, so it was for me to write a book that Africans run away from America, you yeah. know, which is what I come does. We don't always stay here and overstay our visas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I like the way you turn things on their head and, and the way you kind of escalate and escalate. I, mm -hmm. I love, you know, pushing that envelope and the bed bugs, you know, assume this metaphoric significance about, you know, everything that's just basically stifling Ekong in, in America until, mm -hmm. you know, basically he had to, he, he had to run away. So we have um, a question here. Um, here is from Neil Hammonds. Yeah. He says, hi, OM, how did living and teaching in Florida impact your writing and your efforts to finish this novel? Yes, thank you, Neil, for that question. Um, in many ways, coming to Florida in 2018 really helped me because for the first time I was working with colleagues who were fellow novelists, short story writers, poets. So when it became very difficult, they really, really helped me. I was very depressed about it. They kept telling me, when well, you cannot give up now. I don't think I could have gotten that help if I did not come to teach. Before now, I wasn't teaching. So we have a very good, you know, fiction, poetry department, the writing program. For example, um, Jill Simmons, one of our teachers, she grabbed this book, the manuscript, and said to me, when well, I must read it. When I was struggling, mm -hmm. I must read it. Um, I did not want to give it to her because she was undergoing a brutal regime of radiotherapy, you know, to deal with her cancer. And the doctor had said to her, you can only read 30 minutes a day. Mm. So I dilly-dallied, but she was unyielding and grabbed the book from me and read. She went three quarters of the way and the doctor said, you cannot read anything at all because you anyway then she called me and said well i love the work a lot mm. if i were you this is what i would do i would cut and make it you know shorter yeah. you can imagine the book is already a fat book 400 pages now you can imagine what it was yeah and i said what would you cut she said i'll cut out 30 000, 000 words Mm -hmm. And I would cut those things that Americans, average Americans already know about Nigeria or Africa. 
Mm. And I also cut those things average Nigerians or Africans already know about Niger uh, uh, the US. So that quickly gave me the assurance that food, bed bugs would have to be part of this. <laughs> Nobody in Nigeria would think there are bed bugs in America. No way. Yeah. <laughs> and Americans do not know of our food. Yeah, definitely. Food is everywhere in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah. Yeah. So here's another question. It's, hello, Uwem. Does your new novel in any way address Western control of African narratives, perhaps via your de depiction of American publishing? So control yes. of African narratives, which is in a way what, what we kind of talked about. What, editors we, talk, and what do we talk about? Um, see, if publishing remains very white, they are going to have that control. You know, yeah. but if it is diverse, we will be able to tell our story. So one thing that is happening in this novel, normal, in many novels, I cannot say all, in many novels, it's like the immigrant comes from absolute total pain and comes to find salvation in America. So there's a clear hierarchy. So when mm -hmm. it comes to America, there are a few issues, but this is far better than home. Yeah. Um, what I've done in this novel is to actually have someone run back to, to you call it and yeah. to create this Swiftian situation where you don't always know who is better, who is your neighbor. So it was important that I created, you know, the histories of violence between Nigeria and America. So as I'm talking about the Biafran war, which is very dark, you also get to see that this country created the Tuskegee experiment and decided to fry the genitals of all the men in the city, black men in the city of Tuskegee, inflicted them with syphilis, waited for mm -hmm. 40 years to see what became of these people. Okay, that's a war. That's mm -hmm. sanctioned in a rich country. I just talked about the killing of sharecroppers, hanging like 200 of them all over the neighborhood on trees. Sometimes you had eight people, you know, hanging from a tree. I just talk about the killing of 60 million, 50 million Native Americans in this country from Canada to Argentina so that this land or lands could be claimed. So Americans or white people are not in a position at all to say that we Africans are the violent ones. How? Yeah. So yeah. the book is trying to do so many things. And that letter that Etido, not Etido, Ujai, mm -hmm. writes with his friends to America is a very touching you know, letter from the voices of children. You know, so I was trying to make sure that before Americans could say, look at that Biafran war, look at them, they're always killing each other. They should be able to say, we have committed worse crimes out here. These Africans are like us in everything, especially in the impulse, perhaps to violence. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the you know that's the message, and I still remember one editor saying to me, "Oh, woman, well, I don't do Swiftian stories. I like Swiftian mm -hmm. stories, but I don't do Swiftian stories." So he yeah. expected mm -hmm. me to write a story that actually indicts my people and leaves his people free. So that's yeah. the control of the narrative. You know, I was telling you, you know, that some of us we are so desperate to 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 publish, uh, you may fall into the wrong hands. But I've been lucky. I've been blessed. I've been lucky in life. Yeah. Oh, well said. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions, Peter. Um, but this is the ones I can see here. Maybe before we close, you can tell us what you're working on now, if it's going to be another novel or um, short story collection, or if you are just, just recovering from 
from from from this one and you're going to take another 13, 13 years before you write your next book i don't know what i'm working what i'm doing right now it has not even come to that stage where i can say yes this is what i am i am doing and when i know i'm not going to tell anybody because okay. 13 years ago i said i'm 10 years ago i said i'm writing a book called las vegas my village <laughs> <laughs> It has crossed over from west, the west to the east, you know, to be called New York, you know, uh, my village. Um, I just need to rest next after Christmas holiday. I'll have a better sense of what I need to do. I'm very exhausted, but I remain. Um, thankful to all the people who have helped me because without the help of friends and supporters um i wouldn't be here imagine that yado you know yado corporation in saratoga yeah. you know the length of my situation that i was stuck they found a way flew me out to yado they knew i was very depressed they had three parties for me in three days they connected me with other writers yeah. who were struggling, whose works had been rejected by their publishers. And this, this, this helped me a lot to, you know, to, it gave me the energy to go that such an institution that has supported my first book a lot. Yeah. You know, oh, nice. to do this yeah. for, you know, for me. So I'm very grateful to all of you who are here tonight listening to listening to us and to those who have helped me in research and you know all of that um so i i i, I don't know publishing this book two days ago felt like a birthday that comes around like 10 years every 10 years I was 13 that, years yeah i was that really <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a brilliant, brilliant book, and we thank you for writing it. And I'm sure Peter is going to talk some more about how you can buy it. But it's it's a book that you know it's it's been worth the wait. It's just brilliant. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just want to say, Helen's book, Travelers, is also doing the same thing in a different way. But it's in Germany. It's set in Germany. The two books can stay side by side, sit on the same shelf. Um, so thank you, Helen, so much. You encouraged a lot of us when you won that came prize in 2001. And thank you, Peter, for having us. City Lights, Mwah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that, that, that was such a rich conversation and so much ground was covered tonight. I, I feel like we had a very rich meal so very, very filling. And, and really, I'd like to express our gratitude to both of you, Mr. Akpan, Mr. Habila, you, you are such a great interlocutor. Thank you for doing this tonight. It was really an honor to have you both grace our virtual halls. Also, I want to thank Gabrielle and Aaron over at Norton for all their efforts in, in making tonight happen. And of course, all of you in the audience uh, for joining us and, and helping complete the circle.